I was in Angola at the time and I saw my first fistula cases and it was very unusual there because there weren't many, we didn't get many uh, women with obstructed labour and they had to come a very long distance but we had a, a sister, a Nigerian sister mm -hmm. nurse, uh, Sister Cecilia was there and she was really the one who encouraged me to look it up and um, she helped me with the post-operative care, she told me all about it. And then when I came, I, when I was back in the, in the mother house, uh, there was a sister who was matron for here in Kitovo in Uganda for many years. She, when she heard I was coming, and I was really coming here to Uganda assigned as a teacher of surgery, and um, that's what they wanted. But she said to me, you have, there's a lot of fistula in Uganda. So I said, well, I'd better learn something about it. And I went to Nigeria on my way here. And I spent a month there with Dr. Anne Ward in the uh, ETAM, in their center, which was totally devoted to fistula repair. And uh, I had, the day we had about at least six, if not eight repairs every day. So I, I learned a lot from Anne Ward. And um, then, after that, after that, I came straight on here and with, met with Mother Winnie. Mm -hmm. And Winnie was my translator, in uh, interpreter in OPD. And then from then she was also taking the x-ray, she was a radiographer. And she really became, even at that early stage, which was 1967, uh, she, she, um, she encouraged me to look for these people. I told her about PBF and she encouraged me that we'd look for these patients because her, she was struck by it and I was struck by it. If they were there, where were they? And of course, at that time, they always remained very hidden and felt guilty about it, as they usually do. And um, so we began to um, look for people. We had outreach here. There was an outreach community-based health, CBHC. There was an outreach uh, just beginning for the HIV mobile home care. and. Um, for the AIDS patients in their homes. So there was a lot happening here in Kitovo. And uh, so we asked them to try while they were out in the rural areas to um, talk about fistula and to see where there are people suffering from incontinence of urine following birth injuries. And uh, there came a few. And I just saw that at the time, that time I was the obstetrician gynecologist as well as the surgeon as well as the medical superintendent. So I had three, three hats mm -hmm. and had to wear them all the time. So it was quite busy. And um, so uh, it meant that since I had uh, general surgery and I had gynecology and obstetrics all at the same time, I saw these patients in the clinic in OPD and then we asked them, as we usually did at that time, when would they have some money to pay for the operation? And uh, so these women had very little. And at that time, it was time before they were learning how to have uh, sack gardens or anything like that. They had, they had nothing. And uh, so we tried to put something together for them. And so they were, I had repaired the first, my first fistula women on, the, on a list, a gynae list, but then they, I had to put them in the surgical ward. So, it meant that I had only one theatre and uh, the, war, the one ward. So in order to have, to have um, beds available for everybody, uh, of course I couldn't just do them all as they came. But what I did was, by 1993, Dr. Brian Hancock and John Kelly, I suppose it started with John Kelly in Birmingham. I had met him while I was in Angola and I had passed through Birmingham and stayed there. Uh, to and from a few times, so I knew them fairly well, that family. So John offered to come down here. So from 1993 on, we started having uh, regular visits twice a year from John Kelly and Brian Hancock. Brian, Brian Hancock uh, is a colorectal surgeon, and he was very interested and was doing uh, some fish repairs in Kamuli, which is up on the, the east coast. Well, it's not the coast, it's the east, up in the east past Jinja, which is on the way to Kenya. And, uh, but then in, if they came, 30 patients came while they were here, 
Well, it meant it blocked. I had to have 30 beds available. And as well as that, I had to, uh, I felt, well, the theatre was blocked from uh, non-emergencies. I only did emergencies those days. So uh, that made, that, that's why once we started getting funding, which was, uh, we said, we need, really need a specially d- dedicated theatre to this and a special, uh, a special ward. So um, in 2000, which was for me the most exciting year because it was when w- the woman became important on the, on the world stage. Everybody was talking about the rights of women and the, 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 the plight of women here in the, thir- in the developing world. And it, all, it was 2000 it began. And uh, because I had been talking about it for a long time, the, the status, the, how women were put down, they, were, they weren't educated, they, they were just the workforce or uh, the, the, the farmer, really, and she provided the food for the family, but she wasn't the first to eat herself. And it wasn't a, a, pack, a kind of a picture I was used to, mm-hmm. where the, the, normally the children would be fed first and then mum and dad would sit down with them and have... That was I was used to when I was one... We were 11 around our table. And um, so uh, we got... Then we had uh, WHO, UNFPA uh, and Gender Health. In 2000, all the excitement started. We're getting interested in this awful... Um, uh, condition in women, the way they lost their dignity and they lost their power of having to, they lost their first child, most of them. And it really was, a, uh, it was really appalling. And they were stuffing rags and plastic bags between their legs to try and hide the fact that they were incontinent. And uh, I, it really, it really was, it struck me that we must do something about this. And then I, they, we, I encouraged UNFPA and, uh, and Gender Health about trying to give us a hand. So they started their fundraising and they were interested. So in that, the first thing we had to do was to build a unit. And then at the same time, we uh, as a theatre dedicated to Fistula so that it could be, um, we could have a big camp and uh, we wouldn't be disturbing anybody else. So, in by 2004, we had the, we were had the the unit, and 2008, the the um, the theatre was finally dedicated to um, fistula women. When we we found that we, these women had nothing, so we had to they couldn't come because of transport. So we had to uh, have a transport refund to encourage them to come, and. Um, the, the costs of the surgery, and then as well as that, the costs of feeding them and looking after them while they were here. So it it gradually built up. In though in those early days, we had at the at least a uh, hundred or more came to each camp. We were advertising the camp on the radio and television. Now we're doing much mo- more mobilisation in the rural areas, and uh, it all costs money, of course, and. Um, so we have to have the funds for all this. But luckily, we have in gender health are still funding us, and uh, if, you know, supporting us in every way they can. And they have become interested also. I have been we've in, in reintegration because it's all very fine to take a woman out of her situation, and to heal heal her, her fistula. That's great, and she goes home continent. But what does she go home to? She has excluded herself from the community. And now she has to be included. It was it was easy in the case of the woman who had been in the choir and had to leave the choir because she was going back to the choir and determined to do so. And um, the other, there was another lady who uh, she did a drama for us, and uh, she had been how she came that it stirred her up. She was like this for a few years, smelling and feeling very like feeling very badly. And one day she wa- she saw all these ladies having nowadays you know having uh, tresses in their hair and extensions put on their hair, so she just said I, she wanted to go to the salon too, and she went to the salon and immediately the other ladies of her age began sniffing. There's a goat here, and she ran out, threw herself on the ground and cried. So she, now she was excluded as a goat, and it was a new. Uh, she went home. And she, her uncle found her crying, and she said to her, but what is wrong? And then when she told him what had happened, 
He said, but did you not hear of Kitovo? They're talking on the radio about this place up there in Massacre, Kitovo, and you have it all done for you. You can get these things fixed. So she came. So her first dream was to go back to the, to the salon and have her hair done just as she wanted. And uh, that made us all very happy. She did this uh, drama with other women um, in, in, in front with for, for Dr. John Kelly, who had done the repair, and myself and Winnie. We were all there, and we remember very well. And these kind of things give us great satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And we feel, gosh, this ministry is so much, it's very worthwhile. And I really do I think just giving back dignity and uh, getting the woman reinserted into her community, back to her and claiming her rights and giving them some form of self-sustenance. But these women are very poor. They have no land and they have they've lost their baby and they're very anxious to get another baby. And I feel really, until they have the full circle that they have their repair, and then after three months they have their check, and when they have three months abstinence, and then they, we ask them to come back and we'll tell them when they can start having sex again. And then if they become pregnant, they must come back to us and uh, they'll have free antenatal care and they have a free cesarean section. And of the of the 3,000 now, I'd say, that repairs that we have done at this stage, we have had uh, only two women who, two, yeah, remember, very, remember two who have come back and they didn't listen. Somebody persuaded them not to, ah, that's only, don't bother, don't mind them. And they went ahead and had a vaginal delivery and they broke down the repair. But they did come back for a second repair, which was a good thing and promised that they won't do it again. And now we've had, all together, there have been several have had their babies now, nearly 200. And um, they're very happy women. We had here um, a Polaroid camera that's from when a lady from the States gave me and she gave me boxes of film. And that used to bring great excitement because every woman that came with her baby, we took a photograph and gave it to her because it's instant um, developing. And um, that it really was, uh, it was like magic. And you'd see the photograph coming out little by little by little. It was really magic and they loved that. Winnie has been a ma absolute master of this because Winnie has the memory and she remembers everybody. She takes them into her, intimately into her heart and she can remember who everybody is. Now I'm at a stage now, I think of my, my own old age, that I, my, I can't remember who they are, but if she tells me something about them, I will remember the odd Jaja. Jaja, they call me Jaja, I'm a, that's a title of respect for an old lady or a, a grandmother. And I like being called Jaja, I think it's beautiful. So we had a Jaja, we had a, la, last year we had a lady of, she was, she was herself 85, and she had been 40 years leaking. Now, over 40 years leaking. And she had all, she'd lost, she had only one live child out of 10. And that child gave her seven grandchildren, her daughter, but she died a few years ago herself. And Jaja now, Granny, has the seven grandchildren. And um, when they brought her, they're taking care of her and she was healed. Well, the ululations and the dancing we had when Jaja was dry. And when last, two weeks ago, when uh, the Minister of uh, Sport, Education and Sports came from the Buganda Kingdom to ask us, because they gave us money last year from the Marathon, 50 million, to, for 200 cases, 200 repairs. And they came back to see how the money was was spent, the accountability, to see would, how it went. And we sent for Jaja, and her grandchild brought her in, and we sent for many others, one the woman with her husband and their baby, and a few more, and the minister in actually was absolutely delighted, because he was very struck, like the money was well spent. These were women that were repaired since we got that, those funds. And um, Jaja was 
the little old lady, she really was the king, the queen of the, the ball that day with myself and herself. We danced and we, they had drums and everything. We, um, we started a few years ago the midwives of uh, the National Maternity Hospital in Dublin asked me, what can we do for these women? Because they were involved through the Africara, which is Friends of Africa. It was a fundraising set up and they had golf classics and they had various fundraising just for us. And uh, so the, the midwives in the asked us what could they And I said, well, these women haven't been there for years, haven't been able to wear panties. So I would love to think of giving them a gift at the end. I know that um, in Hamlin Hospital they all got a new dress and um, one of the ladies, Barbara Doherty, she gave us funds to buy a new material and we got dresses made for them all. You know the Kachengi, the African dress, beautiful dress. But, so, but I said, but they have panties. They really need, as a, as a woman, you need to be able to put on your panty and have your panty on. So I started the panty project and I said, would they like to send panties? So of course they were delighted. So now I, the panty project has got to a stage where I had a, I got a message from a, a rector of a well she was a yes a, a reverend from a, a church in Ireland in the centre of Ireland and she went, she saw this in the Farmers Journal now, I remember when the journalist from the Farmers Journal came out it seemed a funny contact a Farmers Journal but anyway they had an article about us here and about the Panty Project so she contacted me and she said I'd love to talk about it to my to the people at, on, on a service on a Sunday. And uh, so she got my phone number she, and I sent her all the things I could about fistula. And so the next thing, she had a friend who was had a shop and we got a, I got a message that there was a thousand panties and bras on the way. And would I, where, what would they do? Somebody from Concern Ireland would be, was coming as Kampala, where would they? So I said, I'll go and collect them. That would be worth a special trip, wouldn't it? As a ministry, I, I, I think it beats all. It, it, it's so worthwhile. Uh, well, I would like to, to, to see the end of it today. And of course, because in that way, we're not only repairing as prevention and antenatal care. And oh, I would like to see that uh, how we could end this. And number one would be education of women and their and their husbands. That's very important. That they know what caused that. I think everybody knows the word fistula now, but do they understand how what happened? Because some of them still consider it witchcraft, and uh, and that they've been or else they've been kind of, um, what would you say, witchcraft by somebody else. And look around to see, even when somebody dies, I look around to say, who, who, who was it that put a spell on them? And that is very rife here. And uh, so I would like to see education in, out in those, uh, that they, girls are going to school, but there are still many, there are still many, um, what would I say, uh, marginalized families, they're underprivileged they're, and they don't make it, especially girls who are maybe have any, they might be, uh, have some form of a disability or they may have, maybe their mother has a disability and they have to look after her and um, so they are really underprivileged and nobody sees this unless they go out and mm -hmm. see what's going on in their homes. Um, so if we could, if they could all know that all, fistula is definitely preventable, and that is a very big thing. Uh, it would be nice to think that we could end fistula, as I say, but uh, it's a long far apart. Like there are such, we know there are new cases happening all the time. We know there are ways of preventing it. But it's to get this uh, known all over, and especially in those corners where a lot of information doesn't get there. You see, the infrastructure has to be, first of all, and then the, the education. And after that, you have to start, I suppose, building up gradually through from childhood to uh, womanhood and then into the family. Um, it would be nice to think that, that uh, 
Oh, that fistula was a rare thing. As rare as, I mean, it must have been common in, in Europe at some stage, and it's rare now. You only get it from radiation or something. So it would be nice, that would be it, but I couldn't see it happening in, not in my lifetime. Oh, no doubt about it. I'd say if that, if that didn't happen in 2000, I mean, we wouldn't be here today with, with so much progress. But uh, you can't change people. Ch people have to change themselves and they have to see that change is worthwhile. So I think we have to continue on that line to show that, that preventable things are preventable and worthwhile. It's, it's, I think, yes, an awful lot has, uh, good things have happened. I, certainly, I would say in the past um, 10 years, 15 years, 15 since 2000, a great interest has been taken in fistula. Because we should be thinking about ending fistula, but to have to think of a day that someday that it will be a rare condition and uh, international because it is so rife in all countries in the developing world that they have to know that we care about them, that we care about it, I think. And um, that when I think of uh, peop the people in Bangladesh or Afghanistan or when I hear about them climbing the mountains and up and down, like they have such difficult conditions and yet they have fistula too. And if they know that we care, I think that's very important for, for a human being to know that we care. And international they show that we all care and we all want to see the we do 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 we we are moved by this terrible condition because we're women too mm. I mean, can you imagine what it must be like to have be always either i mean sometimes we get fed up when we have to be running to the loo but my god we say thanks be to god i have to run to the loo mm. because i have control mm. over my functions mm. and i often think about that we don't thank God enough for our, for, our, for our normal physical life, that we can do something. And when you think, see these people, they're just no control of anything. And being pulling themselves away because they know they smell, they're disagreeable. I mean, we all know ourselves, we've stood in a queue, a queue and you can sniff somebody around and you wonder who it is. It's somebody who's wetting their pants and it's drying and wetting and drying and wetting and they smell. Mm. And it's like mm. having somebody with bad breath, isn't it? But mm. it's, um, oh, I think it's important from that point of view mm. and I'm glad to be part of it.